Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and I am here with Christian Bush. He is the author of the new book, Connect the Dots. And this is part of our weekly interview series for Newsweek Better. Uh, we're going to talk today about how to create your own good luck, uh, which is a topic that I think all of us are, are probably pretty interested in these days. And in his book, Connect the Dots, Christian is going to explain exactly how all of this works and how we can harness the tools of serendipity to our our favor, Christian Bush, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. Great to be here. Absolutely. And welcome to everyone who is tuning in. Uh, please type your name and where you're dialing in from into the chat box so that we can greet you and say hi. <laughs> and we are going to be taking your questions for Christian, talking about serendipity and how to create your own good luck uh, throughout the course of our time together. So Christian, the, the first question that I have is how did this how did this actually become a thing for you? I know, I know that in your uh just from from knowing you, I know that in your personal life, uh serendipity and harnessing serendipity has been something that you are very interested in. But like what's the origin story? How did this actually become your thing? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. It really started. So when I was younger, you know, I used to be that kid. I was kicked out of high school, had to repeat a year. Um, transferred my reckless lifestyle to my driving style, probably held the uh, unofficial world record of how many dustbins you can or trash cans you can knock over on your way to school. And then one day wasn't so lucky anymore and crashed into four parked cars, all cars completely destroyed, including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and who said, oh my God, he's still alive. And so this idea that I was supposed to be dead, that stuck with me. And, you know, I asked myself all these weird questions. If I would have died, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? And at that point, I only had depressing answers. And so it took me on this intense search for meaning, trying to figure out what am I interested in? What's the meaning of everything? I started reading this amazing book, highly recommended, especially for times like these at the moment, uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is all about how do we find meaning in crisis. And what I realized is what I enjoy doing the most is connecting ideas, connecting people and seeing how they uh, fit together. And so, you know, in my work then as community builder, entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, and later in academia, what I found fascinating is that the most inspiring, successful, purpose-driven people, they seem to have something in common, which is that they intuitively connect the dots. They intuitively see something in the unexpected and then turn that into positive outcomes. And by doing this, they cultivate serendipity. And so I got really excited by this, seeing it in my own life. It's my own life philosophy. It's, you know, day-to-day -day practices. But also then, you know, the, the, the curiosity as an academic was, is there a science-based framework for this? And so that's what, I, that's what I got really excited about. Is there a framework for this? And then are there exercises we can all use to really make that happen in our own lives? Oh, I think that's really interesting, Christian. Thank you so much for sharing that. We want to say hi to some of the great folks who are tuning in here. We have Javi from North Carolina. Christine is here from Cincinnati. Rosinda is joining us from Madrid. We have Maya tuning in, Denise from California. Uh, we have Rainer from Heidelberg. We've got uh, a LinkedIn user from uh, from Cambridgeshire, UK. Uh, Jeannie is here from Virginia. We've got a LinkedIn user from Toronto. Cheryl from Minneapolis and many more. We're so glad to have you. We're here speaking with Christian Bush. He's the author of the book, Connect the Dots, talking about how to create good luck in our own lives. Now, Christian, what, what is it that prevents people so often from taking advantage of serendipity? Because we know, I mean, in theory, there are opportunities all around us, you know, the sort of proverbial pennies on the sidewalk that I think so many, for so many of us, we fail to pick them up. We fail to even notice them. So if if serendipity and good luck are out there for the taking, what is it that's getting in our way? Yeah. Well, there, there's mostly three three barriers, right, that, that hold us back. And and one is really self-limiting beliefs. I mean, you know, we, we all or a lot of us have this small imposter sitting here, right, who, who says, oh, my God, I'm not ready. I'm not worthy. So imagine you sit in a meeting and you have this unexpected, brilliant idea that comes and then you might not bring it up because you feel, you know, you're not ready and 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 and, and yada yada. Or, you know, we'll, we can talk more about, about other examples, but it's really this kind of that we might hold ourselves back even if we see something by actually acting on it. The second one is really, um, I think a lot of times we airbrush serendipity out of our stories, even though they might be there. Uh, you know, we all probably have taken our CV and, and gone to our next employer and said, hey, 
I did this and then I did this and then I did this. Yeah, or maybe you just ran into someone at a conference and they unexpectedly told you about a new opportunity and then you went with it. But by, in a way, airbrushing it out of our stories, because we think we have more control if we have it in the story, we, in a way, delegitimize it um, for a lot of people, especially in organizations. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about this. And then the third one, which I think is the most important one, is to your point that, that, that we, we continuously underestimate how probable the improbable is, how probable the unexpected is. What do I mean by this? Um, you know, there's, there's one of my favorite examples or, or experiments where they take people, um, and, and I'd love to ask everyone in the audience, maybe if you want to put in the chat, do you consider yourself to be a lucky or an unlucky person? Um, because um, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, but if you want to put just lucky or unlucky, um, I think, Dory, you're probably relatively like con lucky you consider, or, or how? where are you on that? You know, it's I, I feel like I'm sort of in in the middle. I, I don't I don't consider myself unlucky because that seems like so depressing. But also I, I often feel like I have to I have to sort of fight for things. I have to sort of slog for things. So I don't know. Is, is there is there a, a, a middle answer to this? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because it's, it's really um, and Isabella says lucky Gina lucky. And um, that's that's wonderful to hear. We seem to have a very lucky room here. Um, and, and the reason I'm asking this is that a lot of times what we expect to see, we start to see because then we look for it and we start seeing it. What do I mean with this? So there's an experiment, for example, where they put uh, took people who self-identify as very lucky. So people who say, good things tend to happen to me. And then people who self-identify as very unlucky. So people who say, bad things always happen to me. I'm always in accidents and so on. And we probably all know people on this continuum from like very lucky to unlucky. And so they take one of each and they say, walk down the street, go into a coffee shop, grab a coffee, and then we'll have our interview. Now, what they don't tell them is that there's hidden cameras along the street and inside the coffee shop. There's a five pound note in front of the coffee shop. And inside the coffee shop, there's one seat next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big dreams happen. Now, the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five pound note, the money, picks it up, goes inside the shop orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman, they have a conversation, exchange business cards, potential opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person, uh, you know, walks down the street, steps over the five pound note, so doesn't see it, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman, ignores the businessman, and that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, how was your day today? And so the lucky person says, it was amazing. I found money in the street, made new friends, and potential opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And the reason I'm telling this story, I mean, we can probably talk about the second part uh, later in terms of, you know, it helps us to, be, to have a bit of extroversion in terms of connecting with people. But for cl closet introverts like myself, there's a lot of hope in like calm, quiet sources, right? Finding something in a book or on the street, right? The money or taking another road to work and then seeing an old book and thinking, oh my God, that could be a podcast. So the point here being, once we expect that there could be something, there could be money in the street, for example, you will find more money. And so it's really about that kind of like, if we underestimate how uh, probable the unexpected is, then we tend to miss serendipity all the time. I think that's that's really powerful. Thank you so much. We are here with Christian Bush. He's the author of the new book, Connect the Dots. And we have been talking about how to create your own good luck, how to create your own serendipity in life. If you want to check out Christian's book, here is the URL. You can go to bit.ly slash connect dots now, now. This is not a typo. It's now, now. So make sure you go do that and, and check that out. We're gonna we're all about connecting the dots. And especially if you're enjoying this conversation with Dr. Christian Bush, he's a professor at NYU, you can hit the like button and hit the share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well on whatever social channel that you are watching it on. Uh, so thank you all for being here. And we want to just also uh, say hi to some of the great folks who are tuning in to join us. Anil is here from New Delhi. Brent is here from Florida. We've got uh, Lisa from Northern California and uh, Mihaila from uh, Ottawa. Steve's here from Malawi. Ed is in Massachusetts. We've got Holly from uh, Southern California. Roxana from Bucharest. Geraldo from Sao Paulo, Nora from Bahrain, Yasmina is here from Paris. We have a LinkedIn user from Kansas City, and Nets from Southern California. Uh, this is great. Mia's here from Chicago, and many more. We're so glad to have all of you. And uh, we are taking your questions. Feel free to type them in the chat box for Christian Bush, author of Connect the Dots. Christian, one thing that I've been wondering about now, 
the the pandemic i of course i understand you can probably like see it either way but the, the pandemic obviously cut out our opportunities for a lot of things that we would think about as organic networking opportunities you're not really going to conferences so much anymore uh in many cases people aren't even going out to eat or they're not even going to coffee shops those were often the engines of serendipity that we all had and they were taken away. Uh, and I heard many people say, oh, you know, during during the pandemic, you had to be so deliberate. You had to schedule everything. It's not like you can just bump into somebody. It's like you have to make a plan. Did that kill serendipity? What do we, what do, we do about these constrained, hybrid, remote, whatever, whatever circumstances? And how can we still make our own good luck in spite of that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's, there's, there's three parts to it. One is really that idea that you know, what has taken away, been taken away from us, of course, is this kind of emotional connection. I mean, Dory, I loved hanging out with you in person back in the days, right, when it was still possible to, to do that easily. Um, but, but also now, once we reframe that, Zoom and WebEx is our own private plane, right? I can be in your living room without going through customs and like flying over to you, and then I can do that with the next person. And so essentially, it, it makes it potentially uh, that, w that we communicate with more people if we wanted to. But then second to your point, unfortunately, all these unexpected collisions, right? So the water cooler moments, especially for younger people who were, if you're in a company and then every day you could run into the boss of your boss who gives you the next big opportunity or you name it. And so those moments have been taken away in the physical space. And so I'm a big fan actually of random coffee trials where companies essentially take people from across the company and say, hey, like tell us when you're free and then they randomly match them across different departments across different hierarchy levels and so essentially with an inspiring prompt you know saying go for half an hour digital coffee and ask each other what's your key challenge at the moment how can i help and what that does is it both cultivates serendipity within the organization but also it recreates that sense of belonging that we've lost because we always communicate with the same people right always the same five people we're in a team with versus the rest of the organization but then laurie the the the, the third point or i think is, is the most important one which is we can take a lot of the practices that we can do offline online on how we can cultivate serendipity. And so to give you one example, uh, it's the hook strategy. It's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, the whole idea is essentially to say, how do you build memorable talking points into a conversation with your boss, with your colleague, with your uncle, with your sister, whoever it is, whatever you're interested in at the moment, so that they can connect the dots to whatever they are most interested in at the moment. And so to give an example, Ollie Barrett in London, wonderful entrepreneur. If you would ask him this dreaded, what do you do question that puts people into boxes, he would say something like, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently read into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should give a guest lecture. Oh my God, such a coincidence. We are hosting piano matinees. You should drop by. I'm a big fan of making a serendipity journal where we write down two or three interests we have at the moment, you know. Uh, in my case, for example, how to bring the serendipity mindset into curricula and companies around the world, and then really building that into every conversation. You're coming five minutes too late to a meeting. I'm so sorry. I was just thinking about how we can get that mindset into education institution, but now I'm here and I'm excited. And so the point being, um, the more we can do that, the more other people can connect the dots for us. And so there's a lot of these practices that we can take virtually as well um, as, as we could physically before that. I think that's a great point, Christian. Thank you for raising that. We want to say hi to some of the great folks tuning in. Isabella is here from London. Sameh is here from Michigan. Japar is tuning in from Zurich, one of our great recognized expert friends. Brian from Medford, New Jersey. Kathy's here from St. Petersburg. We have Gabriel from Mexico. We have uh, we have Ferhat from Turkey. Dilek is also from Turkey. Peter is uh, is here. I think from maybe from Germany or uh, from Scandinavia, judging from your name, Peter. Uh, we have lots of uh, lots of good folks joining us. So we're uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you. Again, we're here with Christian Bush. His new book is Connect the Dots. And here is the URL if you would like to check it out. Connect Dots now, now. Just to, just to really hammer it home uh, for all of you. So uh, please type your questions for Christian into the chat box. And one, um, Abdallah from uh, from Saudi Arabia, he he's just cutting right to the chase, Christian. He he wants takeaways here. How would you encourage others to connect the dots? You know, get, give us the meat here, brother. How do we become more lucky? We Inquiring minds want to know. That's a great question. Um, so two practices that I'm a big fan of is First one uh, is really around saying, 
getting into the modus of whenever you have a conversation thinking about is there one idea I can connect this to or one person I can introduce this person to I think you know when you look at someone like Dory or, or Peter who's who's here as well Peter uh, great great to see you here you know th th there's this kind of automated kind of great like hey no this relates to this idea this relates to this idea and once you in a way at the beginning it feels a bit forced right when you do that when you think about oh do i have to connect that now to one idea or one person but actually the more you do it the more it becomes a normal kind of modus of what you're doing and then you're seeing connections everywhere because you're like oh my god yes this relates to what i just read yesterday in this book and da, 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 da. and so you it's really kind of priming yourself for, for for doing that another one that that i think is is a lot of times underestimated is the way how we ask questions because we tend to ask these kind of questions like what do you do and things that that put people into boxes right and imagine the situation where you go to a fishing village a village in 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 um in italy and 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 you you meet this this fisher woman and you ask what do you do and she says i'm a fisher woman well, there's not many overlaps you have, right? There's not many dots you can connect in this. Like you might be an amazing podcast host or um, an amazing professor uh, like Dory at, at, at Duke and, and so on. And, 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 and you might not have a lot in common when you kind of look at these functional kind of things. But if you would ask her, what do you enjoy doing? Or what is it about the, the, the fishing that, that, that kind of like you enjoy the most? Whatever you ask that open, is a bit more open-ended, she might say something like, I love the endlessness of the sea. And you might say, wow, yeah, academia is like this. I like, I sometimes love the, op uh, uh, the, the, the endlessness and sometimes I don't. And so the point is that the more we, we, we ask questions that allow people to really go a little bit deeper into what really motivates them and what really kind of they're interested in, the more we can then identify overlaps because we actually have a lot in common, right? We all go through transitions. We've all lost loved ones. We've all had a collective near-death experience with COVID. We have a lot in common. But 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 if we don't bring that up, we can't really connect those dots. And so I think there's 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 always this kind of two-sided thing. One for us to to learn to connect the dots, but also to allow others to to give us some hooks that 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 can connect those dots. Yeah, I think the the hooks is a really valuable strategy, Christian. Thank you for sharing that because it's right. People are often looking; they're looking for something desperately. You know, like, oh, what can I say to this person? How can I connect? So, I, I think that giving them more opportunities for it is very valuable. Um, we're here talking with Dr. Christian Bush. He's the author of the new book, Connect the Dots. If you're enjoying this conversation, uh, you can check out Christian's book. Here is the URL. And uh, if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly LinkedIn sessions uh, for Newsweek, just go to Dory. Clark.com. You can sign up for the email list, uh, get a free self-assessment in the process, and you will get reminders about these great weekly conversations, which take place every Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, and 5 o'clock in London. Uh, so, Christian, uh, we've got great questions coming in, and hello. Please type into the chat box if you're just joining who you are, where you're dialing in from. Jan is uh, is here from Essex, England. Katarina from Vienna. Jessica is here from Sao Paulo. Leilani from California. Far from India uh, and many more. Katarina from Zagreb, we're very happy to have you. And a question came in, Christian, that I think is uh, is interesting from a LinkedIn user. They want to know, do you think that the serendipity mindset is more favored by certain organizations or cultures? If you are, if you're a business leader, for instance, or a business owner, how can you leverage this? How can you make your culture more serendipity friendly? That's a great question. And I think um, both in terms of organizational cultures and kind of national cultures, um, you know, I grew up in Germany um, and, 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 you know, we, we love planning, we love structuring, we love kind of, uh, you know, mapping things out and then real life happens. And you're like, oh my God, nobody told me that there's so much uh, ambiguity out there. And so actually the, this serendipity mindset for me also has been a bit of a healing force to say, look, let me get used to, to how the world actually uh, uh, unfolds. But what, what I find fascinating there is really that, especially when we think about it in the organizational context, where we have that kind of tendency that we assume that planning means having control right so if i'm the ceo of a company or the leader or team leader i want to project like like authority and and by by being able to plan and then stick to my plan right so i go into the boardroom and say this is my plan and i did exactly what i said but actually obviously we all know that this is just not reality that, that this is not possible and we did um, a, a large study actually with um, the ceos of, of top companies who performed really well uh, especially throughout COVID as well. And one thing that they all have in common is that they're extremely good at saying, hey, here's a certain sense of direction or key curiosity or some kind of sense of where we're going in, in a bigger sense. Here's an approximate strategy. But, but I'm telling you already now that as soon as something unexpected comes up, we will actually take that on board. And that's not a threat to our authority. 
that's actually part of the plan. That's that's part of a great culture that allows the unexpected to be part of it. And and you know, to give you one example, there, um, it's it's one of my favorites uh, is the 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 uh, the sweet potato washing machine. And so the sweet potato washing machine is a couple of uh, uh, years ago, a, a company in China uh, uh, called Hire. They do you know they produce refrigerators and washing machines and so on. And they received calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is the washing machine breaking down? Uh, cute cat, by the way, Dory. Um, Thank it's, you. <laughs> and it's it's luck, no? That if she goes from left to right, is, is that luck or, or uh, something like that? So it's good well, timing. I, yeah. I think this is Philip's debut appearance in Miami. So it's actually very, very exciting. He had figured out yeah. how to steal, this, steal the uh, the thunder in New York City. And now he's learning in Miami exactly how to, yes. how to show off his tail in front of everyone. Exclusive performance, yes. But so 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 in that case, um, so so the farmers essentially told them, "Hey, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down," and so you know that's unexpected, and that goes against our marketing plan, right? Our marketing plan says that we use washing machines to wash clothes, right? And so usually we would educate the customer probably and tell them, "Don't wash your potatoes in that washing machine." Now they did the opposite. They said, "Yeah, there's all these farmers calling and saying that that their washing machine breaks down because of the potatoes they are washing in it." Maybe we should just build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine uh, because there's a lot of farmers in China, right? And so that's how unexpectedly, serendipitously so, the, the potato washing machine became a, a new innovation. And so the, the key thing here, Dory, to your question is it's really about how do we create a culture that allows that to happen and doesn't see it as a threat to planning and everything else. And I'm a big fan of very simple things like you know, everyone talks about innovation and change, but nobody really likes it when it's about them, right? Nobody really likes ambiguity and change. And so um, I'm a big fan of small, like baby steps. For example, in the weekly meeting, asking things like, what surprised you last week? Did it, oh, it surprised you that that farmers were washing the, the potatoes that way? Great, okay, let's work with this. So it's really legitimizing the unexpected as part of our plan and then really showcasing that, celebrating it and remunerating it. Um, embeds it into daily practices that then leads to that kind of innovation and the ability to, to cultivate serendipity. I love that. So interesting, Christian, and a great example. And we want to say hi to some of the great folks tuning in. Erez is here from Israel, Motsi from South Africa, Talha from Pakistan, Aaron from New Zealand, and Farah from Colombia. We have an international crowd tuning in to see Dr. Christian Bush, and we're so happy to have you. If you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like button and hit the share button so that all of your friends can uh, join in the fun. And Christian, I, I love this. This was a, a good question that came in from our friend Annette. She wants to know, what are your daily rituals that prime your serendipity? Are there things that you do every day that, that are helpful with this? That's a great question. And, and, and you know, sometimes it's, it's kind of mostly unconscious um, that, that, I, that I do these, these things, I think, nowadays. But, but a lot of it, I think, has to do with someone said that earlier in the chat to, to, to be, uh, to, to, to be um, what's the word, kind with your connections and kind with your um, you know, like introducing people to other people and, and, and really kind of just creating that environment around yourself that in a way, you know, multiplies serendipity. Because if I introduce Dory to an amazing person in Miami and they have an amazing time and then in spirit, I'm at the table all the time, right? And so now next time when something amazing comes up there and, and Dory runs into like an amazing TV producer, they might say, oh my God, yeah, hey, you should talk with this guy who just had this book out. So it's kind of like this thing where I think um, it's both because it feels right to do it, like that kind of like, it's just a modus operandi. Um, and it's this beautiful karmic almost effect that that it has also that 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 good things, I think, um, lead to good things. And, and so I think um, that's really something that that, um, it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning, this Viktor Frankl idea that I find a lot of meaning in connection and I find a lot of meaning in making meaningful introductions between people and really always thinking about, like, is there anything I can add to someone else's life? Um, and especially not when I when I expect something in return, because I think, you know, I think nobody appreciates this idea that that they just get contacted when someone needs something from them. And, and so I think it's there's a lot in that kind of idea of really building meaningful relationships in general. And then, you know, like like um, I think karma usually um, has its way in a very non-spiritual way. I mean, we, we can talk about spirituality, I guess, over a glass of wine. But I think in this case, it's really about um, this idea. And Xavi, thank you for mentioning Adam Grant's book, book uh, Give and Take. I think that's actually a really good one, maybe just as a, as a side note, right? This idea that um, I think one thing that Adam talks about is this idea that givers, so people who, who are very kind of giving, um, a lot of times like 
uh, find it tough to have boundaries, right? So because people kind of get used to that those people are giving and then at some point you kind of get burned out. And earlier in life, I certainly had that where I kind of like was overgiving and I, I kind of churned myself out. And then at some point, it really helped me to, to you know, discuss with the wonderful people around me to say, hey, look, like, what is it that you really want to do in life and, and with the people who are really close to you? And what is the boundary for this? And that is priority. And then everything else kind of like, you know, takes the second fiddle. And I think by doing this, then you can still be extremely giving, but also then find that balance. And and I think, Dori, you, you, you're obviously an amazing example also of someone who, who intuitively is extremely giving and at the same time really gets a lot of stuff done. And I think that's the kind of really interesting balance that I guess we're all trying to find. Oh, well, that's very kind of you, Christian. Certainly the same is true of you. And I think it it uh, bespeaks an interesting <laughs> point here. I thought this was uh, this was a fascinating question. Dean is chiming in, Christian. He wants to know, any suggestions on being perceived as creating luck versus being seen as desperate? <laughs> if, if we're trying too hard to create luck, people might think, oh my God, what's their problem? Uh, so how how do we avoid that? How do we walk that line? Yeah. I think it comes a lot to to what is authentic to oneself, right? Because like, Dory, we've been talking a lot about, you know, there's there's a lot of tactics that are there to create serendipity, right? We can talk more about those, like how you plant serendipity bombs, how you, how you do all these different types of things where you can where you can cultivate serendipity in some ways. But I think it only really truly is sustainable if it's authentic to oneself. Like if you're the kind of person who really, really, really dislikes X, Y, Z, then yes, by any means, you know, pushing the comfort zone is great. But if it feels not genuine, then there's obviously something that 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 might not be the right thing. And so I'm a big fan, actually, of you know, in the serendipity journal where we, as I said earlier, we can write down the interests we have in in order to use it for our hooks, but also then really writing down in my past when did I have moments of serendipity that really felt good and that really kind of felt in that moment good and that felt genuine and, and so on. And what was the pattern behind this? Was there anything that I did that really led to this and that really kind of made everyone feel feel good about it? And then also like what were the moments where that didn't happen? And what was it that held me back or or uh, that, that didn't make it happen? And so the, the long story short here really is I think finding those practices that are truly authentic to one um, and uh, versus kind of trying to force too much on it. And I think that's the big shift also with this mindset to get away from a pitching mindset of like, you know, when you have a conversation with an interesting person, it's guaranteed that that person will have a lot of people pitching to them, right? And so if you're one of a thousand people who are pitching to that person, you're one of a thousand people. Uh, but but if you're the person who just kind of like opens an opportunity space and says, let me cast a couple of hooks, and then let's see what the other person actually is excited about. It's fascinating to see how the most senior of people might then say, oh my God, like I actually wanted to learn more about this. Like, hey, look, let's talk. And so I think it's really about this kind of genuineness in, in casting these hooks in a way uh, that are not pushy um, and really turning that around from a pitch to to someone actually connecting the dots themselves because they are interested in it. Yeah, that's a, a really great point because certainly a lot of folks I know have concerns about how to reach out and build relationships with successful people, people of quote unquote higher status who may be hit up a lot. So I think the serendipity hooks in your strategy that you've outlined is really valuable with that. We want to say hi to some of the folks tuning in here. We have Cleo joining us from Edinburgh. We have Barbara from Norway, Adnan from Turkey, and many more. We're so glad to have all of you. We do this every Thursday, same time, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 5 o'clock clock in London. And Christian, I wanted to end with uh, with one last question. A great one came in from Maya. And she wants to know, how do you stay away from friends that are that are negative? They're like, they're like serendipity blockers. Uh, how do we do that without in insulting them? If you've got somebody who's just like not with a program, they're dragging you down. How do you handle that so we can all bring more serendipity into our own lives? Yeah. That's a great. I mean, thanks, thanks so much, Maya. Um, this is really interesting, and 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 it's almost like you know, there's there's two two answers that pop up in in my head. One is is around that question of is there anything we can do with them so that they could be kind of quote unquote uplifted in some way. So to give an example, um, I I had a colleague in London. Um, I used to live in London for a long time, and uh, you know when I started with serendipity mindset and ideas and yay and and so on, and he was like, Christian, I love you, I love this, but. Like, I don't need this. Like, I'm okay. And like, ugh, but like a little bit kind of like this, this type of, of person. And then we made a deal. We said, okay, do two practices, you know, for the next couple of weeks, ask questions slightly differently, cast a couple of hooks in, in some conversations, and then let's reconnect. 
And so he comes back a couple of weeks later and he's like, oh my God, Christian, I didn't know life can be so joyful. And, and so to me, that was really this thing where you can, th th I could have said nothing that would have convinced him, right? Like nothing. Like I could have pitched to him about the mindset and everything else as much as I want. But by him trying small behavioral changes and then getting into it and then almost getting addicted to it, that's when he kind of took on and latched on and, and did more and more and more of this. So my first kind of answer to this is almost like saying, is there something like a, a nudge that, that can be done in, in a kind of nice way? But, but if it's a given, right, um, and, and, and I think that's something that, that really can hold people back, obviously, right, having negativity around. And, 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 and I think that's um, something that, that um, I've certainly seen also a lot in our research of, of those kind of people who, who, who really kind of have a lot of potential but, but, but get held back. And, and one, one approach that I've, I've, I've seen that, that I've felt is, is, is really helpful is to really think about the communities one wants to be part of that, 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 that have that kind of more the positivity part and then really spending far more time in there and then over time in a way naturally kind of decreasing the time one spends with, with those kind of negativity. So it's not like a, a radical, I, don't, I won't talk with you anymore at all. It's more like, I'm so sorry, I'm really busy this week. Like, let's check in like in, in a couple of weeks. And then like, you know, after and after at some point, like this kind of anyways fades away. And I think that's kind of something that, that I've seen work, I think, with a lot of the people uh, around me who, who, have, who have had toxic relationships to really say, look, just disembed after and after and, 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 and then hopefully, you know, the other person will, will be fine too. But again, I think the first approach always, and that's maybe the, the person in me that always wants to kind of understand what can we do for the other person also, it's, it's, it's really kind of saying, is there something we can first kind of, you know, work with the other person with to, to maybe bring them on the other side. But if that's not possible, then the disembedding might be the other choice. Well, it's a really great and generous attitude, Christian. I love that. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. And thank you especially to Christian Bush for being here. He is the author of the new book, Connect the Dots. If you want to check it out, you can get it in all the booky places that books are sold. And also you can find out more at his website. Just go to bit.ly uh, bit ly slash connect dots now, now, and you can get it right there. Christian Bush, thank you for so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.